I'm just uh, doing some behind the scenes stuff on here uh, with YouTube and I'm uploading another video today. Vlogging a little bit today. Um, and I'm making some lunch. Anyway, I wasn't gonna film this, but I'm gonna throw my camera on it and um, show you what I'm having. Okay, so I'm just sauteing up some onions here. <clears throat> I'm gonna throw some kale in there. I already washed this stuff, so. Um, I'm gonna turn this down a bit. Because kale only needs a second. It doesn't need that much time in there. Um. <clears throat> yeah, I washed this and I took the stalks out of it. Should do it. Throw a lid on it. Give that a sec. So um, I'm gonna throw some sprouts on here. I grow sprouts um, in the van. It's a bit of a process, but uh, I got these things off Amazon. They're great. The caps, and then it's just a small mason jar that I use. Um, these ones are radish, and this one's broccoli. Um, so I'm going to use some of these. I'm not going to cook the sprouts. I'm just going to add them on top to the dish once they're done. Um, and I can do a little video to show you what I do and how I go about that. I got some sauerkraut. All right. There we go. What I should have done is chop my kale up so that it, it's about the same. Cut into little strips about the size of the onions, but that way everything would have mixed up a little nicer, but... All right, so that's that. Put some, uh, some pumpkin seeds on there. That's good. Yay, nice, I just spilled pumpkin seeds. <laughs> <sighs> yep, making a mess in my van, so anyway. That is just about perfect. A little apple cider vinegar. Water. If you haven't had that before, it's a bit of a, how would I say? Well, it'd be kind of thing that wake you up in the morning, but anyway, it's, it's kind of vinegary, but it's, it's, it's good for you. I can see in the comments already. Aren't you gonna wash that cucumber? Um, yeah, I probably should, but I'm pretty sure this is probably grown in some. My video just finished uploading. I'm pretty sure this kind of thing would be grown in a um, like a greenhouse, kind of like a hydroponics kind of deal. And they probably wash these things pretty good before they wrap them up. So. Anyway, if I had a big sink in here with some water, I'd probably wash these the, the cucumber. I did wash I did wash my kale. So that's it. And then uh, put this on there. Love this stuff, Herb and Mare, if you haven't tried it. 
It's basically like sea salt with a bunch of different like herbs and stuff in it. Generally, I wash my dishes right away. This is uh, vinegar, and uh, usually, I, if it's real messy, I'll use a bunch of paper towels just to get most of it out and scrape it out or whatever, and then I'll use some vinegar, paper towel. Uh, if I'm feeling particularly lazy, I might just use a baby wipe or something like that, but um, this is what I've been doing for a whole year that I've been in this van. I haven't got food poisoning or anything. This is just what I do. That's it. Nice and shiny. <clears throat> That's it. Bon appetit. Sometimes I'll quickly open the door while I'm cooking food. That just helps to get a cross draft going for the uh, the roof fan, pull all the, the stuff out. And finally, in the summertime, I usually keep this window behind me cracked open a bit, almost all the time. Hmm. Unless it's raining, because on a Dodge Caravan, these windows in the back, they kind of like, they open out like that and rain will come in and get on the counter here and stuff. So I just open that in days where it's not raining. Otherwise I keep the front windows open a crack and um, they have those little like window covering things on them to keep the rain from getting in. <clears throat> but yeah, I open my door quickly. Especially if I'm sauteing onions, because it'll get like get a little overpowering in here pretty quick. Uh, you learn that pretty quick too. You start off and you're kind of like, "Oh my eyes," <laughs> and then uh, you're like, "I got to do something about that." <clears throat> cool. Well, I just uh, crossed over the threshold here to monetize the channel and maybe make a, a few bucks. I'm just going through the um, the agreement and all that, the whole setup for the whole thing. I'm trying to read it all and understand everything. And of course, look at the content that I've been making, look at the content that I plan to make, make sure everything fits within the guidelines. All that's gonna be just fine, I think. I'm about 90% complete uploading a brand new video, guys. And I'll get that, yeah, that'll be online pretty quick. Anyway, <laughs> kind of fun. <clears throat> as soon as that's done, I'm going to be jumping straight back into the editor. I'm working on the next one. And just keep rolling them out. Right now, I'm not filming a lot. I'm kind of filming this stuff right now. But I'm not actually, like, going out in the woods, going for a walk or foraging for any wild foods just now. That being said, there's like, I, I see like a little patch of bittercress over there that, uh, that I could probably pick, but I'll do that soon. I'm just, you know, and then, then you can kind of see some of that stuff, but. <laughs> I'm looking forward to taking you on that journey. But I'm also like thinking about it and I'm going like, how can I show this stuff without like...
and getting into a bit of trouble with it. I don't want to like, for example, like be like, hey guys, so this is a, um, you know, this is a wild carrot or something like that. Which are, and um, this is how you identify it and all this sort of thing. Maybe I might do that, but for an inexperienced person, a wild carrot, a parsnip or something like that, even, can be easily confused with something called poison hemlock. And that is not something you want to deal with or mess around with. So, that's just an example of something that's got something that. Well, it looks different, but you want to be careful with that. So, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, I'm going to go there and show you what a dandelion looks like on the other hand. Way safer. And a little bit more um, easy to identify for just about anybody. And I'm sure most of you just watching this right now, if you are. Oh, yeah, I know what a dandelion looks like. I cut them down with my lawnmower all the time. <laughs> well, you can eat them. They're good for you. <laughs> really good for you. <laughs> uh, they can be an acquired taste, though. A lot of wild foods can be an acquired taste. So I'm sitting in Squamish doing this work. I was uh, down in Vancouver and I was going to stay there and I'm trying to get in at the shop and get some van work done. I got some emails back from marketing and people that do the filming over there and I think we've uh, kind of loosely figured out a Time when I can get in there they, they're pretty, pretty consistent with updating that film schedule so as long as I work around that and understand like oh yeah as long as I work around that I should be fine over there and I can get in and finish up the van it's been a while since I worked on the van might take me a, a day to get into the groove of it. We'll see. I find sometimes that <clears throat> there's a particular hobby or something that I do, and I'm sure some of you feel this way too. If you take a break from it for a while, and then you like, you know, when you get some time and you go back to it, it can take you a little while to get sort of situated and oriented, if you will, back into uh, what it is that you were doing. And, and certainly if you're picking up from where you left off with something, sometimes it takes a little bit just to get back into it. But once that momentum's going, at least for me anyway, I like to, uh, I like to ride that out because I know um, I can usually make quite a bit of progress if I ride that momentum and then you kind of get to a spot sometimes though when you do that where you, you start to burn out and you can kind of notice you're slowing down, you're you're making a couple mistakes here and there and it's time to take a break and go do something else and the older I get the uh, more familiar with that kind of uh, conclusion or transition I get and yeah it's just you kind of tune into that and you're kind of like okay that's that's good for now and then move on and do something else for a little bit. There's got to be a reason why we, uh, well, man, maybe I'm alone on that. And I, I'm guessing I'm not alone on that. I'm sure a lot of you know what I'm talking about, but I was just about to say something to generalize it. And I was like, well, 
that might not be a reality for somebody out there or even a, a bunch, bunch of people out there and that was uh, <clears throat> I was going to go on a rant and talk about how the just that process that we we kind of we can do something for a little while and then kind of burn out on it a little bit or you need to step away like that might be something that's sort of in our like our uh, I don't want to say like genetic but kind of like our our human evolution like as an as an animal you know that we are that might be a part of how our our brains and stuff work and who knows I, I don't know not really explaining that very well hmm so some of you've been asking about some logistics around around the hunting deer hunting so I'll talk a little bit about this so so far in the videos you've seen like the primary thing that I am going after is deer now out here in the west coast of British Columbia the type of deer that live out here is is called a, um, a black tailed deer some schools of thought or science even will will kind of classify that into a mule deer category but it's a little bit different and some you know some real people that are a little bit more into I don't know looking at the different classes of deer will make a very distinct dis difference between a black tail and a mule deer now they're similar but they're a little bit different anyway and then there's different types of black tail deer so there's like island black tail deer which are pretty much the same thing like if you look here and you go to vancouver island or some of the gulf islands and you're talking about black tail deer they're pretty much the same deer that i'm hunting here they're smaller but that's i think a little bit more related to the environment <clears throat> and then if you go further north into alaska and stuff i think in queen like uh, not queen Haida Gwaii, they used to call that the Queen Charlotte Islands in Canada, but it's called Haida Gwaii now, which I think is a much better name. There's a smaller version of, of black-tailed deer, and anyway, so that's what I'm after. I'm going after black-tailed deer. So you're wondering, like, what do I do with it? You know, if I'm uh, if I'm fortunate enough to harvest one, what do I do with it? So, of course, I field dress it out in the field, and I'm not sure I would actually film and share that part. Maybe it's one of those things where I'm kind of like I've been humming and hawing about that for quite a while, just because it's kind of depicting a little bit more of a kind of a, a pretty sensitive side of it. And I, I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to like freak people out or anything like that. Not everybody's ready for that kind of thing. And I'm not sure it's really like necessary to share it. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube already that sort of shares that side of things. But in any case, so it's called field dressing. You basically do that out in the field. And then what I typically do is I quarter it out, which is essentially just chopping chopping it up into, and now you're referring to it as it because at this point it's really, you know, it, it, it becomes no longer a deer and it becomes food. So you quarter it out in a way that's more manageable to bring it out of the forest or off the mountain. I mean, if you're 
I, everybody does this differently. Uh, this is just how I do it. Anyway, so I pack it off the mountain. Usually it's about two trips for me. So I'll be up there and get the deer, field dress it, quarter it all out, and putting it into uh, game bags at this point. These are, um, for, for for those of you that don't know what a game bag is, essentially it's kind of like a cheesecloth sort of bag, but cheesecloth is a bad example because it's not very good. It's like a tighter weave than cheesecloth. I use a fairly tight weave. My bags are made of orange, bright hunter orange. And then um, put in there, pull the drawstring, and then I'll hang it up in trees and stuff like that while I'm out there just to try and keep it cool, get more air circulating around it. And then what I'll do is I'll take the first load out and I'll pack that down to the van. And um, in here, what I'm doing is I'm carrying a tarp and some plastic. And for a little while, I was carrying a big cardboard box that I was gonna open up and line it with the tarp, line it with the plastic, and then put all this stuff in and then go get the, the second trip and go get the rest of it. And then bring that back. And then once it's all back here in the van, then what I would do, I mean, you, you kind of use common sense. So if it's a really hot day, you don't want to come back and put half of it in your van and then go up and get the other half. It'll just, it'll spoil it. So, you, you know, it depends on the circumstances. You know, I might come down and be like, okay, I'm going to hang it up in some trees over here while I go get the other, the other bit and then, uh, then come back. So anyway, it's in the van. At this point, what I do is I'll drive back to town. And so far the hunting I'm doing is not too, too far away from town, like maybe an hour, an hour and a half drive at tops, maybe two, but usually only an hour and a half. And so for that short of a trip, most of the time it'll be just fine. I might turn the AC on or roll down the windows as I'm driving and wear my warm clothes to keep warm. And the inside of the van will be cold while I'm doing that and then I get to town go to um so right now there's three there's myself my friend mark and chad and we uh we share a freezer together and so what we do is we just put it all in the freezer you know at the at the house we process the rest of it so then that's where you you're dealing with like hind quarter or something and then you're going in there and you're separating out all the muscles and you're actually butchering out the meat and you're wrapping it, wrapping it up, packaging it, putting it into a freezer. Um, so you're just preparing it so that basically all that stuff is ready to go for, you know, when you want to grab some. And that's what happens. All that stuff lives in the freezer until the three of us eat it down. We split it three ways. So, you know, Mark happens to get a deer one year and if we don't, then we're all going to share the meat. And so I don't actually like keep the deer in the van. I, um, I'll just come through town. I'll pull some stuff out of the freezer that I wanna take with me. I'll put that in my fridge and off I go. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Um, I also share a lot of it. So give away a lot of it to uh, friends and family all that sort of thing. And um, use just about everything that I can. The, um, the hide of the animal in the past, what I've done is I've given away to friends that wanted to build uh, medicine drums. And they're like, oh, if you get a deer, can I have the hide? Like, I'd really love to make a medicine drum. And I'd be like, sure. So I, um, I've given that away to, um, to friends and stuff like that in the past. And I haven't actually done any sort of tanning of leather or done any of that sort of stuff myself yet. It's a bit of a job. It's gonna take some uh, premeditated thought and preparation to do something like that. And I do plan on doing that in the future. Um, I'm just not sure when. And then, um, yeah, it'd be, I, I think it would be really cool to prepare all that stuff. And then maybe um, <laughs> I had this cool thought that maybe it'd be fun to reupholster my, my seat with that tan it, dye it, all that kind of thing. And I have a leather seat. 
Um, I could do a medicine drum. There's all kinds of things you can do with the eye. And just to give it away, there's a lot of people that really want that. Yeah, and then that's pretty much it. Now, some more... Then, then it's like, okay, well, what do you do with, with the rest of it? So, typically I'll leave most of the skeleton out in the woods. Um, and I'll leave the guts out in the woods. And that, uh, anything that I don't really want to take out. So I'll take out, like, the meat, the liver, the heart, that kind of thing. I'll, um, I even, yeah, the, the meat, heart, liver. Um, there's something called call fat, um, Generally, I haven't tried it yet, but uh, I really want to take it out on the next animal. So it's basically like a, a type of fat that lines the, uh, the organs and in around the um, stomach and intestines and stuff like that. And it looks like a big spider web. And I think the next time I'll, I'll take that with me. That stuff apparently is just excellent to use as a, um, as kind of like a, a container for the meat as you're cooking it. So like you could make some kind of grind or something like that and then you could, a meatloaf or something, you could wrap it up with this call fat and then that, that'll bring some of the fat from that animal into what it is that you're cooking. Cause deer meat is really, really, really lean. There's, you'll have the fat on the animal and it's called tallow. It's, um, it's not really, the same kind of fat you would see in something like beef or uh, domesticated animals, like food animals, like beef, chicken, turkey, um, pork, that kind of thing. Uh, tallow is like really tough and waxy. It's like, uh, it's almost like bird suet or something like that. It's, uh, it's not really all that pleasant and it goes bad in the freezer like it goes rancid and all that sort of thing so generally I just cut all that st sort of thing off and um, and get rid of it and that's it yeah and then uh, what else the head so the head the antlers I've done a couple things with that so like I've done what was called a, a euro mount which is a bit of a process but it ends up with just like the bare white skull with the antlers coming out i made something like that i made a few of those rather like gone through the process to to do that and uh you know that's fine and all but i live in a van and i don't have room for any of that sort of stuff and i'm not really all that interested in like having that out on display um, so much it's um so I have one in my storage locker and I'm the only one that really sees it it's uh you know it it just means something to me that's it it's kind of like oh I remember that that deer I remember that day I remember that story I remember everything about it I remember what that deer tasted like and all of it so it's uh it's kind of kind of interesting in that way but and kind of think about those artifacts from a hunter's perspective because a lot of hunters would will do that kind of thing it's not really what it's what, what it's about it's kind of like they would you know that's like the trophy of the whole end of the hunt and that word has got a um, pretty strong um, meaning and um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really, uh, well, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, let me say that word is. Well, there's something kind of sickening about it when you think of it. I'm gonna keep that as a trophy. So it's, it's kind of like that, but it's also, on some kind of primal human level, it's it's also not not bad, but it can be it can be used bad really easily. Like it can be used for the for the wrong reasons. Like 
you know, for example, if you were to go out and do that kind of thing because you're after a trophy so you can inflate your own ego and tell all your boys about it, well, that's the wrong reason. That's just, um, you know, I mean, in some ways there's, there's, it's okay to, you know, pat yourself on the back and, you know, celebrate and that kind of thing for sure. Um, but in terms of like going out there to say, look at me, look at how great I am and look what I did and sort of like, you know, I don't know. I, for me anyway, I'm not really into that kind of thing. Can't really support it. But, um, so at the end of the day, something like, like that deer head I have in my storage locker, it only means something to me. If I lived in a house, I'd probably like keep that down in like a little man cave or something like that, that I had. I don't know, that's about it. And then of course the thought is, well, like, okay, well, over the course of your lifetime, you know, let's say you, um, you can kill and eat like, you know, like, I don't know, a dozen deer or something. And so then you got this um, big wall in your house filled with that stuff. Again, it only means something to the person who's a part of that story. But somebody else is just kind of like, well, that's, uh, you know, that's interesting. It brings up some stories for some people that totally don't get it. So if you're like hardcore vegan, animal rights activist, that kind of thing, that kind of thing would really offend you. And you'd be like, dude, what's up? You know, you're a little bit you know, got to fix something in there. So, and a, and there's an argument to both sides of that story. Um, but trophies have been used in a uh, in a real bad ways in some ways. And, to, and yeah, I mean, there's examples out there that that are just like they, they disgust me, and I'm just kind of like, okay, I like to hunt, and because of that. Um, someone's like oh you're you hunt and so you automatically fall in this category just like all these other guys and so like that's a hunter in my mind hunters have got a bad rep <laughs> they got a bad pr problem <laughs> it was really what they got <laughs> anyway what i was getting at is like let's say you have a whole bunch of those things and they belong to to you when you die, like, you know, and you move on from this life, all that stuff's kind of left behind. It's like, I was always thinking, like, what happens to it then? It's not going to mean anything to anybody else at that point. So the whole idea of having one in the first place, when you think of it in that context, is kind of like, you don't keep any of this. The only thing that you really have that's that's like that you can sort of is is like the present moment. That's that's all you really got. And you can look at your experiences and sort of hang on to those too and and enjoy that. Um, who knows if we even keep that? Well, we already know that. And the great unknown beyond the veil of our own mortality is like a great big mystery in a sense, so. Anyway, even before that though, there's mental health and, you know, you get something like, you know, you start running into having dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that. Which is um, kind of, you know, it's in a way it's kind of a sad, sad to, thing to think about that sort of thing, but you, uh, you don't get to keep those experiences in a way. Like they just kind of, they just kind of go. And I think the only thing you do really have is just the present moment.
Anyway, well, that's quite a rant. I'm still eating my lunch. I bet you this video is already up. Mm-hmm. Alright guys, there's a few details I need to do on here, so I'm just gonna like wrap this up and uh, get this video up and eat my lunch and finish clicking through the rest of this uh, application process. So, uh, we'll see you later. Stay safe out there. And uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, ciao.